Hi there, everyone. I just want to thank everybody for coming on this uh, kind of drizzly Wednesday evening uh, for the Markham Age Friendly Design Guidelines Public Open House Number Two. Uh, just a note that this event is being recorded. Um, and with that, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Next slide, please. Thank you. We'd like to acknowledge tonight that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, a territory that is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We recognize that our work is an ongoing commitment to be in better relationship with this land and its peoples, supporting Indigenous sovereignty and justice for all. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mayor Frank Scarpiti for a welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Emery. Good evening, everyone. And uh, really great to see so many uh, familiar faces at uh, tonight's event. Many of you were here. Uh, hard to believe it was only January. It, it feels like it was yesterday, but appreciate uh, your ongoing interest and, and uh, having so many of you uh, come out uh, again. Uh, before I start, I just want to recognize uh, the, the members of council that are here. I'm not sure I see everyone on my screens, uh, but want to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, Regional Councillor Joe Lee is here, uh, Regional Councillor Jim Jones, uh, Ward 1 Councillor Keith Irish is here, uh, Ward 2 Councillor Alan Ho is here, uh, Ward 6 Councillor Amanda Colucci is here, Ward 7 Councillor Khaled Usman is here, and I think that is it for members of council. And uh, uh, if we have more, join us uh, later. We can certainly uh, try to acknowledge them uh, during the program. And also want to say a particular thank you to uh, our commissioner, Arvind Prasad, who's the commissioner of development services. And I know that uh, he has uh, some of his staff here. I, I won't introduce all the staff, but to really say this, uh, this initiative, like so many, at the city of Markham is a, is a team effort. And uh, you'll begin to understand why uh, when you see again, once again, all the different aspects uh, that we're, we're having to cover. And uh, we'll say that I'm extremely proud of the, uh, the fact that Markham continues to develop strategic initiatives and, and deliver on policies and programs that uh, truly help residents of all ages in our community stay active, uh, healthy, and engaged in the community. And goodness knows over the past uh, couple of years, we know how important it is to uh, stay engaged and to be connected with each other. And so the, the city of Markham is, is really making an effort here to ensure uh, that we consider the, the well being and inclusion of all ages within our, our policies and, and practices, and obviously continue to work to change the way that we uh, design our communities and some of the solutions that we incorporate into the, the built form and also to uh, the housing that gets created in the city and certainly uh, just overall the community itself, that it's accessible, that it's functional, that we all feel safe and adaptable for obviously people of all ages and, and abilities. Uh, it's, it's critically uh, important. So back in January, I think many of you will remember, we had our, our open house and uh, we certainly heard from a, a good range, a cross section of, of people uh, about age friendly design and, and the importance of that and the challenges that we currently face within our, our community, right down to our homes, uh, our neighborhoods, our parks. Uh, to the to the overall uh, community and, and the opportunities that exist to make uh, our community uh, much more age friendly. And many of you that night, uh, because uh, those of us that were there, listened to your, your great ideas. And uh, we had a, an opportunity as well to reach out to the broader community through Your Voice Markham. And I know there's also been an opportunity to both have some online and uh, paper surveys to get more input from a broader group than just have the ability to come out to public meetings like this and uh, hear their ideas. And, and we also 
anytime we did have a public event, as much as it was limited, we also took the opportunity at public events to get further feedback. And there were various other opportunities through uh, outreach at our libraries, through workshops and one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, interviews. So really following on the success of, of the open house that we had back in January, any the uh, variety of engagement activities, uh, what you're going to hear and, and see today is really, it was time well spent. I hope that you see in the recommendations, your ideas that have been incorporated in developing our draft guidelines, uh, which is really an important step to uh, making the city of Markham a more age-friendly uh, community. So again, I thank all of you for coming out. I thank members of council. And I think I, I also noticed that Councillor Andrew Keyes is here from, from Ward 5 has been able uh, to join us. So uh, I welcome him. And uh, aside from the people that are here, uh, we've also been engaged with various committees like the Seniors Advisory uh, Committee, the Committee on Age-Friendly Markham, uh, the Mayor's uh, Markham uh, Mayor's Youth uh, Council, and of course, uh, all of the people that have come out uh, in, the, in the open house session. I thank you for, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I'll say too, thank you for sharing your experiences. You know, sometimes when we take a look at these broader issues, it, it gives us amazing context to hear your stories, to hear your experiences. And I, I want to thank you because I know for some of you, it's actually, you know, you've, you've, you've let us uh, into your personal space. You've told us the difficulties and challenges that you face. And that's not always easy to do. But I'll tell you, it's been enlightening hearing those stories because it's helped all of us as we've developed these draft guidelines to really think about that personal perspective. And uh, I know that's not always easy to do, particularly in a public space. And I wanna thank you for the way that you've been so forthcoming and so straightforward in, in all the advice and, uh, and experiences that you shared with us. And so with that now, I'd, I'd like to really hand this over to, uh, to uh, Parthvi Nempu-3 and uh, thank her as well. Uh, she's been an incredible uh, leader throughout this whole uh, process. And I think when, when you hear her uh, speak, uh, you hear the, the enthusiasm that she has. She gets excited about a lot of different aspects of planning, uh, but to, to see uh, her commitment to uh, these guidelines and, and moving forward, uh, I say we're lucky to have her, to have someone as determined as she is uh, to see this project through so that as we move forward as a community, what our guidelines will actually be incorporated in meaningful, meaningful elements in our community that will make it more age friendly. So Parvati, I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you for your ongoing work and leadership. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for those warm and inspiring words. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. As we heard from the mayor earlier, city of Markham certainly intends to be a leader in developing accessible environments for all by embracing the principles of universal design to create an age-friendly city. The age-friendly guidelines will recommend design principles and solutions for our built environment with the intended outcome of creating homes and communities that are accessible, functional, safe, and adaptable to anyone aged zero to 99 with varying abilities. These guidelines will provide design direction for new and redeveloping communities, focusing on three scales, the unit, the building, and the neighborhood. The guidelines will inform city staff, members of the, members of the development community, and public on design options that will help make Markham age-friendly. Today's virtual open house will provide an overview of the key findings from the recent public and stakeholder engagement sessions, as well as new content from the age-friendly design guidelines, the draft version of it, which is still under development. And we are really hoping that the input we hear today will help us uh, finalize the guidelines, make it more robust and more user-friendly at the end of the day. 
As with our first open house, we have an experienced team from Urban Strategies with us here today to share and present these findings. So without taking more time, I'm going to invite Emery Davidge, Senior Associate at Urban Strategies, to introduce the consultant team and provide us an overview of today's event. Emery, thank you. Thank you, Parvati. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emery Damage, and like Parvati mentioned, I'm a senior associate here at Urban Strategies in Toronto. Um, if I can, I'm just going to go through quickly the agenda for today, then I'll, I'll introduce you to our project team. Thank you. So, you know, just for today, we're going to kind of continue on with this welcome and introduction. I'll introduce the project team and go over um, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, what to expect for tonight. Then we'll get right into the presentation. Um, bit of a, a refresher on what is age-friendly design, then we'll go over kind of the process and work to date, and then get right into the age-friendly design guidelines. Then there's gonna be an opportunity for you to ask any questions um, or share comments that you might have about what you've heard tonight. Um, and just a reminder that this presentation will be shared after the event tonight on the Your Voice Markham website. Uh, and then I'll quickly jump back on and talk about next steps, and then we'll have some closing remarks. Next slide, please. So just a little housekeeping, um, asking folks to stay on mute um, throughout the presentation. There will be an opportunity at the end for the Q&A. Um, if you do have a question related to a specific or particular slide, if you could note the slide number, that would be very helpful. You'll notice there will be a lot of slides tonight, so you'll see the number in the corner there. So that'll help us be able to go back and refer to that slide. Um, and just, you know, general reminder, we kind of get to the best answers by hearing different points of view. So let's just try and keep the comments and, and questions civil. I don't think that's going to be a problem tonight, but something I like to remind folks um, as we have these virtual sessions. Next slide, please. So this is our team. So we're led by a great staff team at the City of Markham. So Parvati, who you've met, Ranji, who's the City Architect, and Abby Carr, Senior Planner in uh, Planning and Urban Design and the consulting team. Uh, so Urban Strategies were the lead and we have Michelle Trockmay with us tonight, who's a partner, uh, myself and Jamila, uh, who is gonna be giving part of the presentation tonight, who's a planner with our firm. Unfortunately, Stephen, who is our urban designer was unable to attend uh, this evening. But with us, we have uh, Camille and Alex from LGA Architects who will be, you'll meet later on in the presentation and will be around for the Q and A. Um, also part of our team, uh, Kerr Smith Design, they do a lot of kind of forecasting and future thinking about key drivers and, and impacts that might um, affect our work as we move into the future. So um, again, they aren't with us tonight, but their work has contributed uh, extensively to what you'll see tonight. Next slide. So what is age-friendly design? So for the purpose of this um, guidelines document, so Age-friendly design is the design of the built environment that responds to the needs of all residents, from young children and families to older adults and seniors. And again, it's all ages and abilities. You'll hear that term uh, used quite a bit tonight. Another term you might hear is aging in place. And so aging in place refers to the ability to live in the same home and or community safely, independently, and comfortably as you age. Um, and this is really important. And it's not just in, you know, kind of your house itself, but it's also in your community access to services and programs and, and community that you might need as you age. Next slide. So these are some examples of age-friendly design in Markham that you might see um, as you're out and about on a daily basis. So starting from the left, we have secondary suites. So that's Cornell, a uh, great example of, of coach houses, um, laneway housing, provides housing options for family members. In the center there, you have um, a great example of streetscape, you have townhouses opening right onto a street, separated with a, a landscaped um, barrier from the street and places to sit as folks walk and can gather. And you have parks with intergenerational amenities. Uh, that particular park has splash pads, adult fitness equipment, a walking path around the outside. So it allows people of all ages to enjoy the space at the same time. Next slide. Okay, so talk a little bit about the process and work done to date so far. Um, as the mayor mentioned, I think many of you might have joined us back in January. So you can see we're here in phase four, um, which is the draft guidelines, which we'll be presenting tonight. But it's 
everything that we're presenting to you tonight has been based on this work up to this time. So uh, phase, phase one was just kind of an introduction to the project team, better understanding um, kind of the key objectives from the city of Markham side. Then moving into a background review and analysis, we did a global um, case study and best practice analysis, kind of figuring out what, you know, what's happening out in the world and in the region uh, around age-friendly design. Then phase three, uh, public engagement. And we had, like the mayor mentioned, uh, an online and paper surveys, uh, the Your Voice Markham webpage. We had a zero to 99 ideas challenge plus the first um, open house. Um, and through that, we got over 200 responses by a survey and uh, the ideas challenge and had just over a thousand unique visitors to the Your Voice Markham website. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the actual age-friendly design guidelines document itself. Next slide. Hop back one. Right on. Oh, there we go. Right on. So I think uh, Parvati mentioned the age-friendly design guidelines focuses on design at three scales. So we have the neighborhood scale, the building scale, and then we go down to the unit scale. Next slide. And so the document itself will have um, obviously prefaced by a pretty robust introduction that talks a bit about those drivers, kind of the process, how uh, the guidelines are intended to be used. Then the, the meat of the document is the guidelines themselves. And again, they'll be structured um, under these three scales. So the neighborhood, building and site scale and the unit scale. And then the last chapter will be the implementation piece. The presentation tonight is focused on that chunk in the middle. So we'll be going through um, each of the three scales in depth. Uh, next slide. And so the actual guideline structure themselves, it starts at the scale level. So you'll see section 2.0, for example, starts neighborhood guidelines. Then we move down into this kind of overarching heading, um, key features of age-friendly neighborhoods. Then we go into the subheading that talks, you know, uh, co-locating community amenities as the example. Then in the document itself, it'll go down into the actual guidelines. For the purpose of tonight's conversation, we're going to be sticking to the top three levels. We're still working out and hoping to get input tonight through the Q&A and through work we're going to be doing with city and other stakeholders to refine those guidelines before we come out with those uh, later this month. All right, so I'm going to move right into the neighborhood guidelines. Next slide. So what we heard uh, through the engagement uh, when we're talking about the neighborhood scale, households with children were most concerned with unsafe traffic and road conditions um, in their communities, and that included speeding traffic, unsafe crossings, uh, lacking sidewalks, and needing safer routes to schools and parks for their children to travel, particularly when children were able to travel on their own. Um, other concerns were connectivity throughout the neighborhood. Uh, again, it's keeping accessible routes away from busy streets, separated multi-use pathways, um, improved wayfinding, and just ways to figure out um, to show where locations of local parks and playgrounds are. Next slide. Households with older adults, again, similarly, were most concerned with um, unsafe traffic and, and road conditions um, and perceptions of safety in the community. Uh, so lighting was a really um, was something that came up over and over. So particularly in parks and public spaces, uh, dangerous encounters with wildlife, so particularly coyotes um, and poorly maintained sidewalks. So that really um, had to do with, I think a lot of the timing of the engagement was just after that major snowstorm we had early this year. So a lot of it was around snow and ice removal and then better accessibility uh, with a desire for uh, improved public transit, better wayfinding and increased connectivity to services and amenities. Next slide. So key features of age-friendly neighborhoods. I'm just gonna go right into it if you'd like to go to the next slide. Right on. So co-locating community amenities. So finding opportunities to co-locate complementary services and facilities with new development to optimize community benefit, promoting shared use, improving access and creating hubs for age-friendly uses and intergenerational activity. And this is a great photo from uh, Kipling Acres long-term care home here in Toronto, where they have a childcare facility um, incorporated in with long-term care uh, seniors housing. And they have shared programming uh, several times a week where they bring their children and the older adults together. Next slide. 
comfortable microclimates. So as we know, we're getting, uh, I think it's warmer, wilder and wetter weather. Um, so we need to design outdoor spaces that create microclimates that are comfortable in all seasons. So that's, you know, in the cold snow of the winter, you see here in Corktown Commons, there's, you know, a covered area and also a um, place to be get warm near the fire there, but also making sure we have protection from the sun, rain and snow all seasons. Next slide. Community safety. So communities should be designed to promote natural surveillance while ensuring a safe, comfortable environment for everyone, whether they're walking, rolling, uh, cycling, particularly relative to vehicular traffic. We really heard that from members of the public that people needed to feel safe. Um, this example in London talk, just shows how a street can be designed. So there's kind of safe ways for everybody to move. Next slide. Well-maintained public spaces. So again, maintaining a high quality public realm that ensures equitable access to community amenities during all four seasons. And this is just an example of the city of Vancouver where they plow sidewalks and bike paths first. Next slide. Play finding and whimsy. So creating engaging, playful and livable communities by incorporating whimsy and play in public art, building design, streetscapes, parks and urban furniture. Next slide. Intuitive wayfinding. So the design of the public realm should really help folks with finding where they're going. So that helps reinforce a sense of place, creates visual interest, and it really helps um, when folks often with dementia or memory related illness, for example, um, newcomers. And it's really important that wayfinding incorporates both text and non-text based ways um, to delineate space and, and, to and to share information. Next slide. Civic engagement. So also what we know is in order to create age-friendly design, we need to talk to the people who, you know, live it every day. So we need to ensure that the planning and design process is age-friendly, providing equitable opportunities for people of all ages and abilities living in Markham as we're working through these processes. Next slide. Okay, so mobility and connectivity. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because we have a lot of slides to go through. Next slide. So the block and street network, we want to design street networks to be safe and walkable uh, with blocks that are porous for pedestrians and cyclists so people uh, can move around freely. Next slide. We need to design streetscapes that promote walkability and feelings of safety. So providing that kind of buffer between the traffic and the sidewalk. Um, you, have, you see different kinds of pavement or paving surfaces there. You have landscaping, different places to sit. Providing those strong visual connections as well between interior and exterior spaces helps really animate those streetscapes. Next slide. Sidewalks. So safe, accessible, and generous sidewalks are encouraged on both sides of the street in every neighborhood. And just thinking about kind of the width of sidewalks and just thinking about our users. We have folks with mobility devices, folks with um, strollers, small children uh, riding on scooters or on, on tricycles with their family. So just making sure there's enough room for people to pass safely is important. Next slide. Pedestrian crossings. So making sure we're designing pedestrian crossings to be well lit uh, with non-slip markings and with both audible and vibrotactile cues. So that's making sure that there are different ways for people to know where they are in space, uh, regardless of their ability. Um, and you'll see that example there really helps shorten the distance when crossing the street because you know often when you have such a what sometimes you're really wide streets and it sometimes takes folks a little bit longer to cross and so providing that kind of central space to rest can be very useful. Next slide. Micromobility. So creating a cycling network that is safe and comfortable um, and should be designed to provide access throughout the city to key age-friendly destinations. Next slide. Uh, for recreational trails and walkways, they should be barrier free, offer places to rest along the entire route uh, for both adults and young children. And you'll see there, it's really important that the surface is accessible, again, to folks with mobility devices, wheelchairs, strollers, and, you know, even just, you know, young children learning to walk, having a, a flat, you know, paved or at least hard packed surface is key. Next slide. Parking lots. So, you know, we need to park somewhere, but we should ensure that surface parking lots have walkways that are clearly marked, protected, and well lit at night. So people aren't, you know, walking behind cars as they're coming out of the store with their children in one hand, groceries in the other. Um, next slide. 
Okay, parks and open space. We're gonna move right into park access. So we need to provide equitable access to parks and open spaces so users of all abilities can visit and spend time. Uh, we need to ensure they're safe, welcoming, and animated. So this is a great example. This is a trailhead in Unionville, and it has a range of amenities. You can just see in this one picture, there's a bike rack, there's a bike service station with tools uh, to fix a flat tire, there's recycling, trash, a place to sit, and there's really great, it didn't get captured in this photo, but there's great wayfinding that tells you exactly the distance until the next um, stops on the path. Next slide. Park programming. So we need to design parks to allow for flexibility and seasonality with a diversity of activities that cater to all ages and abilities, thinking about reducing barriers um, for everybody to enjoy the space. Next slide. Public washrooms. So really we heard this from a lot of people. Public washrooms need to be there all year round. They need to be accessible, they need to be clean, um, and they should be provided in all major existing and new parks. Next slide. So for playgrounds and play spaces, they should be welcoming and inclusive to a, range, a diverse range of users, including people who are young and old, uh, caregivers, and for children and adults with disabilities. And so this is an expression swing and it allows a caregiver to go on the swing with their child at the same time. It's a great idea for multi-generational play. And urban furnishings. So go right into seating. So seating in streets and parks should be designed to accommodate a variety of user needs. Uh, so having lower seats for children and benches with higher seats uh, for older adults who may have trouble rising uh, from a seated position. You'll see this example here in Cork, Ireland. Uh, the bench is a little bit higher off the ground and you'll also see there's a plaque on the side that has um, a wayfinding component and we, we have seen best practices of benches that are marked with numbers and so again if someone's needing medical assistance they can say I'm on bench 26 and I need help or similarly uh, someone's lost um, they can call a, a caregiver to let them know where they are. Next slide and weather protection features so again we've talked a lot about climate uh, the public realm should include structures that enable year-round use of streets and parks with weather protection. Again, heat, sun, rain, snow, ice, and wind. They need to be able to be um, designed to cover all of that. So they can include the strategic planting of trees. You know, evergreen trees are good for some reason, for some things. Deciduous trees also provide, you know, shade in, in the summer and, and light through in the winter. And considering other landscape elements, um, and purpose-built shelters or shade sales as needed. Next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Jamila to go through the building and site design guidelines. Thanks so much, Emery. So um, we heard from households and children, um, some of the main concerns were that there are no play areas for children in or around the building and also concerns around improving building amenities, um, play areas for children, shared outdoor green spaces, spaces for pets, composting and recycling facilities. We also heard from households with older adults, um, concerns around uh, a desire for more accessible entrances with fewer stairs or more gentle ramps, more elevators, increased access to outdoor spaces, as well as their building um, could allow for them to comfortably age in place. Um, we also heard from households with older adults about better access to community amenities, particularly health and wellness services. And so all of this has informed how we thought through the guidelines for this section. Um, ground related residential buildings include single detached homes, town home, townhouses, duplexes and triplexes, and they should be designed to accommodate the needs of households to support aging in place. So in terms of ground related residential buildings, um, it's important for them to be designed to have no step access. You can see here in this image that there isn't a step and there's a kind of gradual entrance into the home at the grade, a grade related home. Provisions should be made for secondary suites that accommodate multi-generational living and primary living spaces should be located on the ground level. Uh, this home has a front terrace that provides visual access to uh, visual access to the street and allowing folks to see the animation that's going on. Parking garages should be designed to have weather protected access as well as integrated accessory units where appropriate. We saw this image earlier of the secondary suite in Cornell, and it's a great example of multi-generational housing. Generational housing. 
And this section also gets into multi-unit residential buildings, including mid-rise, high-rise buildings, and that they should be designed to serve the needs of older adults, people with reduced mobility, as well as growing families. Um, for building configuration and site layout, uh, we think that buildings should concentrate lower, larger units with multiple bedrooms in the lower portions of the building to serve families with, living with children. You can see here in the image, um, folks are able to have these play spaces at the ground level, um, and it allows for um, opportunities for families to have barrier-free access to their units in the street. Buildings should be designed to allow for future flexibility throughout unit organization and building systems. One of the ways that can be done is through wood frame construction, which affords um, added fl flexibility within designs for low and mid-rise buildings. And then we also heard a lot about the importance of having play spaces in buildings. So common indoor and outdoor amenity spaces should be universally accessible and provide program space for various age groups. This is a really great example. Um, it's a new development in Toronto and it has an interactive playroom in the ground level of the building. It allows for families to come and interact with their neighbors. Buildings should also uh, think about the lobby and entrance design and ensuring that these spaces promote lingering and community building, um, having different types of uh, flexible furniture in the lobby space allows for folks with mobility devices to also sit and linger and engage with their neighbors. Uh, design circulation spaces uh, should enable independence while also supporting social interaction. Um, this is a really fun image. You see a wide corridor in the hallway um, where, the multi where the family size units are located and children can kind of, you know, move up and down around that space and it becomes like an informal play space as well. Parking garages should be designed to have both playful and intuitive wayfinding. Um, this example shows these artistic expressions in the parking garages that provide informal wayfinding, orientation, and also soften the space for children, because sometimes parking garages can be very intimidating spaces. Uh, storage and utility needs. Um, the guidelines talk about the importance of including convenient and secure storage for larger items like strollers, bikes, and scooters in key building locations. Oh, no. Great. And then I'll just oh. ask... I'll just pass the to LGA. No, no. Sorry, I think we can mute that person. No. Great. I'll just pass to Camille and Alex to discuss the building, the unit guidelines. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Tedesco. I'm a partner at LGA Architects. I'm here with my colleague Camille, and we'll present the unit guidelines. Next slide, please. So we'll start with what we heard. Um, for households that with children, we're, we're most concerned with um, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms in their home. Um, bathrooms, having two teenagers right now, I can totally appreciate that comment. Uh, adding or improving access to outdoor spaces in the backyard, so that really addressing the fact that there's a lot of times uh, level changes and um, stairs are needed to, to access the, the backyard. Uh, adding additional space to their home and increasing the size of improving configuration of kitchen and uh, the importance of storage and other parking options. Next slide. And then households with older adults, uh, what we heard was reducing the number of stairs or finding alternatives to stairs to make the unit more accessible and a little less challenging to live in. Adding uses to main floor uh, to consolidate living spaces on one level. And we'll get into a lot of detail on that in the presentation. And re renovating the space to make it more accessible. So allowing the space to be renovated without major structural or, or changes to plumbing that uh, allow the person to, to live and adapt uh, in the space and unit. So these are, we have uh, four sections and this is the first section and we're, we'll focus on the interior layout of the unit. So building flexibility and adaptability in the unit is critical. Um, that is a matter of pre-thinking uh, pre and having early conversations 
uh, when the before the unit is actually built so that the unit can be adaptable and flexible in in as the the person ages in the place so that we can easily adapt spaces um, without major structural or mechanical or electrical works. Entryways are a big focus. A lot of times entryways are forgotten spaces. Uh, uh, a lot of times people try to minimize that space to make room for other rooms in the house, but it's, it's increasingly important when you start to think about uh, early families with uh, strollers and a lot of carry-on bags. And then as you get older spaces where you can park your scooters or other uh, means or aids to help mobility. Kitchens uh, need to be thought through uh, to allow for uh, more equitable uh, allowance for counter spaces, um, store spaces so that, so that they're easily accessible. They're not just, um, they're not just built to adapt to the everyday. Next slide, please. Washrooms, pre-thinking a washroom where you allow enough space um, in the future to, to allow for mobility devices is important. Also pre-thinking about the construction of the unit so that in the future, if you do need accessible uh, bars, they're easily implemented without doing major renovations to, to structurally reinforce the walls. Next slide. Laundry spaces, a lot of times these, again, as the entryways, these are forgotten spaces, typically built too small. Um, so we encourage the, the allowance of space to allow for mobility devices, also to allow for uh, equipment, laundry equipment that are side by side versus stacked to allow for accessibility is important. Living rooms, um, these are typically um, historically good sized rooms. What we would want to encourage is connections to the outdoors, um, physical connections to the outdoors so that this room can flow into the exterior spaces, especially if you're, um, if, if you're isolated in a house uh, during the cold winter months where you can't really feel safe outside or accessing the public sidewalk because it hasn't been plowed yet, but allowing the ability to get uh, an outdoor space accessible to you. Again, connecting to the outdoor space, the importance of that being having um, periods of isolation, allowing some uh, opportunity to, to get outdoor space and uh, fresh air is, is increasingly important. And, having lived through a pandemic, I think it's, it's we all understand the importance of that um, ability to, to, to breathe. And bedrooms, consideration of having the opportunity to have primary bedrooms on the ground floor or a space that allows for this uh, so that uh, people can age in their houses without accessing stairs uh, should be considered. Even the, the space around the bed should be considered if uh, you do have a mobility device that you need so that you're not, uh, it doesn't feel congested or overwhelming not being able to get around the bed. Um, utilities, so often forgotten, but often uh, a source of frustration without being very specific of where outlets are placed. Um, if, if no one says anything, they'll just be placed in to meet Ontario building codes. But with consideration, you know, they, they won't be located behind a couch or something that's not uh, accessible uh, and forgotten. So being able to think through this um, and placing them in convenient and accessible places is, is important. Okay, so this section moves into the interior design and finishes the considerations that uh, we are suggesting the guidelines take and thinking about the um, 
the, the interior finishes, materials that go into your house that um, contribute to the sort of overall well-being of the space. So sort of um, thinking about like sort of entry and approach of the house or creating a sense of place and distinctive character. So where possible, sort of providing units with distinctive characters through materials or colors and tactile qualities, which promotes wayfinding for kids, for older adults, and also helps create a sense of individuality within um, sort of multi-unit residential buildings. Uh, and the consideration of daylight, again, is extremely important. So thinking about the access to daylight and the placement of windows and being able to see out them and, um, you know, taking that into consideration for different uh, reaches or uh, visibility heights. Uh, artificial lighting. So units should provide carefully planned artificial lighting throughout the home to ensure safe movement throughout low light hours and provide guiding lights for residents with impaired vision. Floor finishes should be carefully chosen to be durable, sustainable, uh, and ensure safe movement throughout the home, uh, including non-slip and high grip surfaces, as well as materials that provide tactile cues. And thinking about acoustics, you know, specifically for thinking about multi-generational housing, so acoustic privacy should be provided in the design of the new units, taking to, into consideration adjacencies of private and shared spaces, such as, you know, kitchens and living rooms and, you know, them being next to, say, bedrooms or bathrooms, um, and, you know, really being thoughtful about the design and placement of these, uh, uh, of these rooms next to each other and taking into consideration the acoustical properties that can be used um, within these spaces. So unit circulation, so thinking about how we move through our units and move through the spaces that we inhabit. Um, next slide. So starting with hallways and doors, which I think Alex mentioned, you know, sort of maybe forgotten spaces, um, but they should definitely be wide enough to support mobility devices or strollers. Um, and just allow for an ease of movement into and through the home. Um, and, you know, it offers, you know, having them be wider offers more storage opportunities as well, which is always important if you think of households that have multiple children or multiple people living in them. So stairs, where possible, the stairs should be designed um, as a straight run or straight flight um, without landings for easier installations of stair lifts. Um, they should also provide a color contrast features for users um, just to be able to sort of safely get up and down the stairs with people with low visibility, um, just to avoid any sort of trip and fall potential hazards. And the unit, we're considering that the unit should potentially be designed to include um, lift uh, design and or lift in inclusion and in future renovations. So thinking about the planning and where this might go, um, so into like closets or um, in certain shaft areas and thinking about the construction and reinforcing within the walls um, as the design for the unit is taken uh, approached. So we also thought about future um, adaptability to deal with sustainable features. Um, we do a lot of projects where, you know, owners don't know if they want to introduce solar panels on their, uh, their houses or uh, geothermal. Um, but um, what we do allow is preparation for those, um, those opportunities to be plugged into the house without major renovations or considerations. So we have a bunch of ideas about how you can prep a house so, or a building so that future sustainable opportunities are available. Great, thank you, Alex and Camille. Um, so now we are going into the Q&A portion of our event. Um, I just want to remind folks, uh, the way this will probably work smoothest is if you use the raise hand feature. So you go down to the bottom of your screen, there should, if you look down, there should be a, a little section that says reactions. And if you click on that, there's an opportunity to raise your hand. 
and we will call, I will call on you uh, by name and then we'll kind of pass off and I'll unmute you and then you can ask your question and then the appropriate member of our team or members of our team um, will be able to respond. So give me one second here to open the, all right. So I have, the first question is gonna be from Jack Heath. My apologies. I, I was waiting for a question number one, two, three, five, ten before I uh, my name came up. I was not expecting it. Um, I really, where's Jamila? I really liked her slide number 51. Um, uh, and it showed um, a, um, a single family home, or maybe, I don't know if you can put it up, or a town home. Um, or, or a, a semi, sorry. Um, all we build in Markham nowadays are townhomes, um, uh, generally our, our townhomes, uh, and when and maybe um, uh, some singles, but we don't build any like this, not one. Uh, we don't build those anymore. Um, uh, we build them four or five or six steps up to the front door and then usually a few steps up inside the house to get to the main floor. Uh, and the main reason, of course, is that it costs a lot of money to, uh, to uh, dig a complete basement. Um, uh, a half basement is a good deal cheaper than building up or digging a complete basement, waterproofing usually, things like that. Do you have any examples of, uh, um, this is an excellent one, but do you have any examples, Jamila, of uh, where else in the GTA anybody has been building townhouses that are level to the ground, uh, um, anything like that? Uh, at the top of my mind, not right now, but um, definitely invite the other team members to step in if they, if they have anything on their mind. But it is something that we can pull some examples and, and share with you after the presentation, if that's helpful, Jack. Well, I think it's very important um, as uh, uh, the senior generation gets older that we start at least uh, providing or, or introducing into the marketplace a uh, percentage of houses that are built uh, to the ground level rather than up in the air uh, so that people who are having more troubles with knee, knee problems and things like that come walk right into their house uh, rather than, I mean, we. I, I must say the other, I mean, much as I appreciate it, I like you know, I, I like providing it. The long ramps that go the length of the building one way and then the other way really aren't overly amenable to having a, a, um, a really nice townhouse development. Uh, and so the best way to solve the problem is the house is level to the ground and you don't need to build a ramp. Um, and the second question, and this is it, the second question relates to that. Um, how do we ensure that the... Uh, the building code uh, or the planning act, and I'm not sure which one it is, allow us to require that of a certain number of houses, uh, as opposed to I'm arm twisting and things like that. I'm trying to show twisting your arm to ensure the developer does it. How do we ensure, how do we as a municipality um, have any power to say, you must build 15% of them level to the ground? Do we have that or, or how do we get that? Thank you. So if I can just comment on that uh, uh, question by Regional Councilor Heath, um, we have explored uh, this question of um, avoiding steps to houses with some developers since uh, you brought the issue up uh, I think last year or the year before the last. Um, and I can't give you the technical details, but there's something to do with the height at which stormwater management ponds are have to be located. Uh, given TRC regulations, uh, it's from what I hear from the developers, it's next to impossible to put the grade in such a look, way, to grade the property in such a way as to be able to accommodate uh, a situation where that completely avoids all the steps. Uh, our urban design department certainly works to lower the number of steps uh, as part of applications, but to eliminate steps, um, the regulation, the TRC regulations have changed over the years. So from what I understand, um, that is a big, big uh, roadblock to achieving what you're suggesting. Hmm. I know I live on a street um, 
where one half of the street, the other side, not my side, but the other side have all all got um, houses that have no steps to the front door or maybe one um, off the driveway and up onto the sidewalk to the front door and there's no steps. Uh, and uh, they're all 30 or 40 years old. Um, and uh, uh, they were built, of course, and that was uh, at some point in time. But I stand behind my, uh, my, uh, my position that it's the cost of building the basement that requires all of them to be uh, uh, five or six or seven steps up in the air. Um, and thus, it's so much cheaper to do that. Um, and uh, I wish we could find a way around that because it's seniors are going to, they can't, I mean, I'm now a senior myself. My knees are not going to like doing that all the time and we won't have anywhere for us to move. Anyway, thank you. Uh, Emery, before you move on to the next speaker, yep. I, I just wanted to say, I'm, <laughs> I was going to introduce regional councillor Jack Heath, but uh, he beat me to the punch on uh, asking his questions. <laughs> but I also <laughs> wanted to say that Deputy Mayor uh, Hamilton is here uh, also, and uh, Councillor Ray is here, Councillor Karen Ray. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Michelle, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I, 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 I'd like to just pick up on Jack's point regarding um, the, the, the challenge, but the opportunity of creating uh, a certain amount of houses that have um, zero or minimal steps leading up to the, the entrance. And it, it's, it's very difficult to do that on a, you know, for, for one house or for two or three lots uh, in a row. On the other hand, I think the opportunity exists when you are uh, planning and developing larger areas of land to grade the land so that you can meet that objective. Your 15% your seems like a, you know, a really a, a good target, if not more than that, but uh, you could certainly do it in a way that, that grades would allow you to, if you do it right, to, to, to have 15% of the houses that are above any of the kind of TRCA uh, concerned, uh, you know, flooding and things of that nature. And you could so certainly also develop uh, prototypes where the front of the house is at grade, but perhaps um, uh, access to the back garden through a side yard takes you down to the back of the house, which might be slightly below grade at a, and allow for basement units to have um, some kind of access to the rear. So, so that's where the opportunity is. And from my perspective is thinking about this when you're, you're, you're master planning larger developments um, uh, in order to, to meet this objective. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so I'm gonna to go to Peter with the next question followed by Anthony and then Satya. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I listened with great interest most to the neighborhood guidelines. Just wanted to make a couple of comments. Great. One, you seem to be silent on street trees. Uh, I don't know if you are or not, but um, I think that's an important uh, thing to yeah. put in somewhere. I'm hoping our guidelines will uh, emphasize those. More importantly, um, I was very interested in your opinion on sidewalks on both sides of the street. Um, I'm sure you realize how controversial that statement is. Um, personally, I live on a local street, not a collector, and I like having a sidewalk there, even though it's a quiet street, but most of my neighbors would um, object, I think. so. Where is your head at on sidewalks on both sides of the street, be it a local road or a, uh, a collector? Um, I, my opinion again is local road should have a sidewalk on one side, even though it's costly. So on one side or on both sides? My personal opinion is collectors both sides, um, local road one side. Thank you. It is something that we did here in the engagement. It came up quite a bit. Um, might defer to Markham staff for this one first and then to the design team. I can just start off and I, I'll leave it open to anyone who wants to jump in as well. But our current standards for local roads and new communities is to have um, sidewalks on both sides. Um, 
And this is, we are seeing that in, in our communities in the FUA, for example, that, that are being designed and built at the moment. Um, and I welcome anyone to participate, but just want to add that it's an important consideration for pedestrian safety. And as, as the city encourages active transportation, pedestrians and cyclists to use the streets more, um, it is important to provide safe access to a public street. Otherwise, we end up pushing uh, pedestrians and, you know, especially children live in, in these neighborhoods wanting to, you know, go with their bikes or uh, seniors who live in these homes. They want to walk. It, it's unless you get to a safe crossing, it's hard to cross and access um, the, the sidewalk across the streets. Um, so it, it's from a safety and accessibility perspective, it is certainly um, a welcome practice. And I think that's what's being reflected in the guidelines and the research that um, uh, the urban strategies have done. Okay, I, thank you. I, I, I'm happy to hear that. I forgot this was new communities only, I guess. So yeah, new, uh, new communities, um, sidewalks on both sides of all streets would be great. I guess I've been um, tainted a bit by the retrofit um, uh, debates that have been held, but uh, thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> Thank you. Michelle, did you have anything to add here? Yeah, I simply wanted to add that, you know, the this this whole absolutely sidewalks on both sides of the streets, but streets have become more and more complicated to design um, as we are trying to make them more equitable for all sorts of forms of mobility. But also as we start to think about um, accommodating, uh, uh, future-proofing and, and, and accommodating um, uh, unexpected storm surges and things of that nature. So things like rain gardens and, and swales and all of that. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming more complicated. It's, it, again, it's a, all of this is about good design and it's all achievable and absolutely sidewalks on both sides of the streets. Thank you, Michelle. I'm gonna go to Anthony followed by Satya and Evelyn. Uh, I'm Anthony. Anthony. Okay. I got a couple. Sorry, it's Arvind. Before you just move forward, uh, just on the sidewalks on both sides of the street, while it's the consultant's position to provide sidewalks on both sides of the street and his policy to do so in new development, it is an issue that we continue to investigate. And, you know, uh, I just want to say we will be bringing further direction and uh, thought to council in the future on this issue. Everything we do in the development community, everything we do in terms of the built form adds cost, to the, uh, co uh, ultimately adds to the cost of housing. So, you know, it's a balance, right? You have to think about it, all of these different aspects to making recommendations. So I, I just don't want it to be left to the impression that sidewalks on the both sides of the streets are now in trenches policy. This is consultants' recommendations. Staff will look at this. We will get back to council. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry, Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, okay, sorry. So I have a couple of comments. Number one is on page 42, you talk about a uh, uh, public washroom in a uh, year round. And this morning I took my mother-in-law out for a walk and guess what? She said, I didn't want to drink any water before I go out because I don't know where is the next washroom. And it's pretty sad because like uh, as over the adults, we want people to go and get a walk and get some sunshine. And myself included, I don't want to go out for too long because uh, if you look at the parks in uh, Markham, not too many parks have uh, public washrooms. And even that, I was in Mill Park, uh, Mill Dam Park yesterday. The washroom was not open, although there are lots of people using the park facilities. So I think, I don't know why it takes so long to make the public washrooms available year round. I mean, it's a no brainer and we don't need a design guidelines uh, to make this happen. So I really want to have uh, this public washrooms availability and also make it more accessible, available in more parks. That's uh, my first comment. Thank you. My second comment is about um, earlier in the presentation, you talked about uh, uh, road safety on sidewalks for pedestrians and for cyclists. I was on a bike yesterday on 14th Avenue and my life is more important than uh, following the traffic rules. So I, I rode on a sidewalk. Yeah. But again, I know it is not right because the people are using the sidewalk to walk. So I urge the city to look at making the road safe for both pedestrians and uh, cyclists to make more uh, uh, bike lanes and bike paths and so on. And for BC roads, I think 
we should separate uh, the bikes and the uh, walk and the sidewalks because pedestrians and cyclists cannot exist if uh, in the busy uh, in the busy street. So these are my two comments. Thank you. All right, Satya. Yes, good evening. And I think it was very, very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question on that is, um, you know, in the, uh, like already neighborhoods uh, develop, uh, we have kind of park uh, across the street from us. And the concern is that what type of security for seniors and all that can be provided there? Are there any video cameras? I haven't seen any or in person or what, what kind of security is provided or going to be provided? Thank you. Thank you. So that's a question around security in an existing yes. park in a yeah. neighborhood. And so is it, um, are there particular issues in that park? Is there, is it after dark? Is it lighting? Is there anything specific or is it just kind of a, a general feeling? Well, like everything it? really, because the lighting is also not, the, not that much, but even during the daytime, um, security is, a, because crime is increasing now, right? So it is a big concern for seniors to be walking there and uh, especially when it's not busy during the daytime. So uh, what can we, pray? because there are no public washrooms there, there's nothing, right? So those are the concerns for us to, you know, go out to <laughs> walk there. I think one of the first things I would say before I, I kind of pass it off to one of, one of my teammates or Markham staff is I think one of the things that can make people feel safer is having a higher concentration of people in the space. So if you're not the only person there or one or two people, and so it does speak to that kind of park programming and park amenities piece. And so if there's something there to bring people multiple times of the day. So if it's young children coming in the morning, school-aged children coming after school, programs, you know, organized or semi-organized sports or a recreation, those kind of things then make, you know, the park just a more lively place. And that feeling of safety increases just because you're not alone or you have people, it's like the eyes on the street principle. And so I know my experience with that, sorry, I'm interrupting. No. But my experience with that, with the neighborhood is that Mostly people complain, but they don't come out to complain at the level, like tonight's meeting, for example. They don't come out to complain or bring out the issues at that level, but they, when you meet, they talk about it, that these are the problems. So um, I, I think and in our neighborhood, there are a lot of seniors too, and they do bring out, they talk about it, but that's why I thought of bringing it out. Um, and then I will have a little bit follow up comment on it. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, I guess I just maybe bring it up with your ward counselor if there is something specific. If you, I'm, you know, I'm sure those conversations have probably already started. And is there anybody from the city side who have anything to add on this one? Thanks, Maria. We can definitely take the comment, Satya. Thank you for, for your comment. And uh, uh, we can discuss that internally, what we can add to this guideline. But that was crime prevention through design. It's definitely a big you know, body of research. And there's a lot, there are a lot of guidelines out there related to that. Um, so how to activate spaces and eyes on the street. We talk about that a lot in the design world. Um, to have more people watch spaces and streets and public realm in general. So it's definitely an important consideration in the preparation of these guidelines. So th thank you. Okay, so I have a follow-up little comment on it that I heard, uh, you know, about the sidewalks um, being brought out and uh, in our neighborhood, I guess uh, it is uh, 30 plus um, years developed and uh, we have like one side uh, sidewalk, not the other side. And my feeling on that is that, you know, the sidewalk side, we pay higher taxes on, whereas we lose the space of the driveway, whereas other side, our opposite to us, they pay a little less taxes and they yet they have the longer driveway. So how is it fair? Great if question. it's both sides, yeah. So if it's both sides, it's, it's okay. But one side, we pay more taxes and lose the space too. Okay, we'll make sure we take that note. I'm sure Mark and Brooks are taking that note as well. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, next is Evelyn, and then I'm gonna go to the chat where there are some comments there. Hello, good evening. Thank, uh, the presentation was uh, really nice. I, I really like the different colors of doors in the buildings. I think that's a very, even for children or for people with uh, visibility and for older people, I think with uh, Alzheimer or other kinds of issues, I think that was brilliant. Uh, my issue was with the glasses, right? On the staircase, I think it was very interesting because you are saying, okay, the staircase has to be safe. You have to be in the holding. What I'm seeing now is that a lot of the new buildings, they put glass on the stairs. So that is for people that are visually impaired. It's very confusing because they see through the glass. Yes, there is no, it's too transparent. And I think that has to be taken into consideration in new buildings. And even for example, when they are doing like in the front of the buildings that they put glass, it's like, visually very yeah uh, and very difficult even for example if you fall the stairs and you bring him to that side you break the windows you fall down so i think that's a very important consideration the new guidelines uh the lighting on the i think was uh, emery that showed the the gardens with the lighting the lighting was not uh, night sky friendly the lighting has to be going down. That is more, uh, is more secure. So I would suggest you use another kind of uh, lighting that goes down, that's more secure because you have more lighting going down and you don't have shadows. Thank you, and it also eliminates that light pollution. That's a great point. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the sets, uh, like I prefer, I think, why the sidewalks in one side of the road then in two sides of the road. So instead of having two narrow sidewalks, I would think that it's better just to clean one side of the road, but to have wider, because then you can use that example that was presented where you can have benches and seats and bicycles and whatever. So I think it's better one side of the road that is wider instead of two. And we have to take consideration if we pay more property tax to clean both sides of the road, right? is more expensive. I think uh, the street trees are very important, like uh, Peter said. And my last comment is, I think to be accessible as well, during construction, what happened is that construction put all those walls very close to the street. And we have seen this in all new developments that are happening in the old neighborhoods or the new neighborhoods. It's really not secure. It's dirty generally and is very narrow. So I think they should take in consideration not taking the construction so close to the sidewalks because that is dangerous because it's, it's dirty, it's dangerous, people fall. And we can see this even we have like one construction close to us uh, where is uh, the golf club at the end of Royal Orchard. Th there were seats before for the older people to come uh, and there is not there now. They cut the trees, the that were promised to be there. There is no benches for the other people to rest. So it's it's not a safe environment. So I think when there is a construction, it should be a logistic, how to build that infill or a building or whatever it is with better protection to the pedestrians that are walking there. An excellent and, uh, point. My, my last question is, when will these uh, guidelines be implemented for new constructions? A great question. I'm going to throw that one to privacy just around the timeline. Yes. Thanks, Emery. Uh, thank you for the comments, Evelyn. So our plan is to have the draft guidelines. Uh, we are hoping to present it to our Development Services Committee um, uh, in mid-May. The agenda will be will come out, and then we'll take in more um, feedback from members of council and uh, community as well. We'll have more discussions. We have a few industry stakeholder sessions planned with the development industry as well. Um, so in the end, the hope is to have the final version of the guidelines uh, presented to Development Services Com Committee um, in June, July before summer break. Um, and hopefully um, it'll be in good shape to be uh, to take to implementation. That's our hope. 
Okay, thank you. So, and I think we'll be sorry. Sorry, will be interesting if we have sorry. an email at I the think... end. We can send other comments that we have. That so, we can. I'm going to get to that at the very end. There's going to be a way. So, Emery, before we move on, um, yeah. unfortunately, I was on mute. I was just going to jump in after Parvati uh, made her remarks. Um, in terms of implementation, we have to keep one thing in mind. A lot of these guideline uh, ideas that are coming forward uh, are not legislated. So it'll be a matter of us working with the development community to see what we can achieve. But once council endorses a document, it'll give us a staff more strength to negotiate with the developers and twist arms uh, when necessary. But uh, it's not guaranteed, because as I said, uh, it, it, there, it, is a, it is a negotiation process. Um, it is not, a lot of this is not legis legislated. So, so we have to work with the development community uh, and members of council to, to make a lot of this happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bijou. All right, so I just wanna go to the chat. Uh, we have a comment from Christiane that says, uh, some aged neighborhoods were designed for access for all ages um, and uses by ensuring that the roads were extra wide. The problem is if any drivers um, and seemingly right to all have seemingly a right to all of the roadway uh, when it's not so obvious to begin with. These neighborhoods should be considered as pedestrian friendly and traffic should be controlled. So again, that speaks to kind of what we've heard throughout the engagement process of just figuring out ways for all users to feel safe and have the ability to move uh, to and through space. Um, further comments in the pictures, um, I assume in the presentation of the friendly uh, age-friendly roads, sidewalks, paths, uh, the middle of tower complexes and the age-friendly routes that we showed are very heavy on the concrete or hardscape surface areas with little natural environment um, needed for a health, so with limited natural environment. So that's natural environments needed for a healthy, good quality of life for persons of all ages. More natural environment is needed. COVID has proven this. And 100% agree there is a fine balance um, of accessibility and having hardscape allows people um, to travel kind of unencumbered. So if you are in a you know, mobility device, wheelchair, scooter, um, if you're pushing a stroller, or, you know, pulling your wagon of groceries, there is that, that kind of hardscape surface that is needed. Agreed that, you know, we can look at more kind of vegetated landscape features alongside, but, um, we can't just have it all. I know that folks really would just like kind of a trail surface sometimes, but that isn't actually accessible um, to all. Uh, another comment around extreme lighting causes extreme light pollution. Uh, we hear you think that the image we were, uh, that Evelyn just mentioned was showing not that kind of night sky friendly um, lighting. And it affects not only humans, but also the same effect on any um, in, environmental creatures and vegetation. So that's definitely something to take into account. It's again, that balance of safety and, and the need for lighting um, for folks to be able to use a space after dark um, and kind of dawn and dusk hours as well, we heard, um, and you know, minimizing that light pollution. And there are definitely ways to do that. And then another comment from Regional Councilor Heath, uh, like Peter's comment about sidewalks. Um, we have a policy in Markham and a phasing policy for arterials and major collectors. So much more work to be done. Uh, the issue is potential limitations on parking in the driveway and car jockeying. So I don't know if there's any comments uh, from anybody on the team to what we've just heard in the chat there. If not, going to do a, a last call for questions. Again, if you have any kind of further questions or comments, please use that raise your hand feature. And if not, I'll jump back to the presentation and the next steps. All right, so I'm going to just hop back in, go over the next steps. So just uh, Kind of echoing what Parvati just mentioned, kind of as we move through uh, what we are phase four and five of this process. So we have some upcoming meetings with the Technical Advisory Committee, which is an internal interdepartmental committee at the City of Markham with folks um, from multiple disciplines uh, that we've been meeting with regularly through the process who kind of bring their subject matter expertise into our work to make sure that 
you know, we're hearing things that are happening in adjacent processes and we understand um, mostly directed to the implementation piece, but also how it, you know, applies to different building code and, and different policies in existence already. Uh, we have meetings with the Seniors Advisory Committee and the Committee for Age Friendly Markham um, to kind of have deeper conversations about what you've heard tonight. We are meeting with stakeholders in the development community um, and other key stakeholders. Um, we've, we've had some conversations with builders, trades folk, people in the industry, architects, and we're gonna be kind of closing the loop with them. Um, and then like Parvathy mentioned, the meeting with the Development Services Committee um, in to help kind of shape into the final guidelines piece that will go to council um, in June or July of this year. Next slide. And just for opportunities to learn more. So the Your Voice Markham webpage has all of the information that was shared tonight. We're gonna again post this um, presentation online. There's also the engagement summary. So the kind of results of all of the engagement done to date is provided there um, in a document, as well as all the supporting kind of information that kind of helped us develop these guidelines as they stand now. Um, there will be, there are, um, Kind of links to the different project team members. So if you do have additional comments from tonight, there is a, an email address on there that you can send um, any comments or questions. And you'll see right there, it's very small on the bottom, but it's agefriendly at markham.ca. And so I can put that in the chat as well. Um, so if you do have any comments or questions, I know sometimes it always happens to me, it'll kind of, a question will come to me in the shower uh, tomorrow morning and then um, feel free to either refer to the deck uh, as this presentation will be posted or just send your comment and we'll make sure to, you know, gather with all of the comments that we heard tonight as we, you know, refine the guidelines further as we take them through to the uh, DSC meeting coming up in May. I just see there are two more messages in the chat related to the sidewalks again, so. All right. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Commissioner Arvind Prasad for some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Emery. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all members of council, staff, our consultant teams at Urban Strategies, the, the Senior Advisory Committee, the Committee for Age Friendly Markham, the Markham Mayor's Youth Council, and members of public for all participating and attending the various events we've had with respect to this, including tonight's uh, open house. Um, as with our first event, this open house has facilitated great discussions about various age-friendly design topics for the city's consideration as we continue to develop and refine the guidelines. We need to continue our commitment to ensuring the inclusion of all ages in Markham. This can be best achieved by working collectively with our community partners. Today's open house has provided very important platform for us to share the draft contents of this guideline, provide an update to, on our progress to date, get your input, answer questions and work together for an inclusive and resilient age-friendly Markham. So we've heard a number of interesting points tonight. Uh, first of all, there is a clear need for homes with accessible entrances. And there are opportunities to look at different housing prototypes that would allow these accessible entrances to provide age-friendly designs. Secondly, we heard about active transportation facilities, specifically a focus on sidewalks. Um, there's also separated bike lanes. These are all important considerations to encourage pedestrian safety and access for both young children and seniors to create safe and walkable neighborhoods. Parks should be designed to enhance safety for all users. We heard that also. And of course, we heard about access to public washrooms. This is just a, to capture a few items we heard today. We heard more than this. Staff and our consultants would take um, input from today's open house into consideration and continue our commitment to ensuring that we consider the well being and inclusion of all ages in the continued development and refinement of the age-friendly design guidelines. Now, I know that there has been some um, chat uh, in the chat about the development industry. I can tell you we are consulting with the development industry. 
We will be bringing this presentation to, to them. They're aware of this work and they will be fully engaged prior to making recommendations to council. Before we end tonight's session, I'd like to say a few words about the importance of this project. As we heard many times throughout the course of the study, it is crucial that we acknowledge the needs of all residents of Markham in the design of our homes and our communities from young children to older adults. I am proud to support this project, not only as a representative of the city of Markham or as a leader in the city building initiatives, but also on a personal level. This is very important to me. Together, our ongoing engagement activities and outreach with the community. Again, I mentioned the development industry, other key stakeholders will make this project a success. I believe that our collaborative efforts will make age-friendly guidelines a meaningful tool as the city continues to grow. So once again, I wish to thank everyone for sharing your dedication and active engagement at this open house. Your contributions to working towards creating an age-friendly Markham through design is very much appreciated. With that, I'll close off tonight's event and thank everybody for attending. And uh, again, your voice for Markham. Our website has uh, all the information. It will have this presentation also on there and, um, and also contact information should you wish to reach out to staff. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Commissioner. Good night, everyone.